Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the anthropology section of the New York Academy of Sciences. My name is Uzma Rizvi, and I'm Associate Professor of Anthropology and Urban Studies at Pratt Institute. In my role as chair of the board of the anthropology section, I wanted to thank all of you for joining us from all the various places and times you may be from. This evening, at least evening here in New York City, we're excited to present as a part of our 2020-2021 programming on reimagining resilience, a panel discussion with anthropologists, filmmakers, and anthropologists who are filmmakers. Our panel entitled Migration Through the Camera Lens, Ethnography, Film, and the Migration Crisis brings into conversation new works exploring the political and experiential elements of migration. Prior to this evening, I hope you were all able to view Border South, which focuses its lens on the border space between the United States and Mexico, and Selections from the Burning, which focuses on the southernmost borders to the European Union in North Africa. In order to ensure all of this programming can happen, we rely on grants and sponsors. And so I'd like to kind of begin with acknowledgement of those uh, grants. We'd like to thank the Wenner-Gren Foundation for Anthropological Research and Bergen Books for supporting the anthropology section. Equally significant is the board of advisors for our section. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the many hours of work done by our board on these events. I particularly wanted to thank board member and vice chair Matt Riley and our treasurer Ryan Rome as well as our anthropology section fellows, Anna, uh, Anna Sergeva and Miriam Leitner. Without all of them, none of this would have been possible. Our panels this evening uh, include Jason DeLeon, who is professor of anthropology and Chicano Chicano and Central American Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. He's also the executive director of the Undocumented Migration Project or UMP Inc, which is a 501c3, which means it's nonprofit. We are also joined by Raul Opaz Pastrana, a Mexican immigrant filmmaker and cinematographer. In fact, Border South, which we screened as part of this event, is his most recent film, which follows the migrant routes from southern Mexico to the U.S.-Mexico border. Our third panelist is Dr. Isabella Alexander Nathani, who is an award-winning writer, filmmaker, educator, and human rights activist. Her latest book, Burning at Europe's Borders, which is coming out with Oxford University Press this year, and related documentary film, The Burning, uh, uncover the human sides of our global migrant and refugee crisis. Contextualizing, framing, and moderating our discussions is Naim Mohamed, who recently received his PhD in anthropology from Columbia University. In addition to his degree in anthropology, Naim is an award-winning artist, filmmaker. He makes films and write essays about rhizomatic families, malleable borders, and socialist utopias, beginning from Bangladesh's two post-colonial markers, and here we're thinking 1947 and 1971, and then radiating outward to transnational linkages. For his films, he's received a 2014 Guggenheim Fellowship and was a finalist for the 2018 Turner Prize and the 2019 Herb Alpert Award. He's currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Society of Fellows at Columbia University and a senior fellow at Lunder Institute of American Art at Colby College. Before I hand this off to Naeem, I wanted to let all of you know that we are live tweeting during this event at NYAS underscore AMP, that's NYAS underscore A-N-T-H. And so if you, are, if you are so inclined, please do join the conversation there. To become part of our growing community, you can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram. It's the same handle at NYAS underscore Anth. You can like us on Facebook and join our email listserv and become part of our vibrant community of anthropologists. Finally, throughout the course of this webinar and panel discussion, you can post questions in the Q&A in the question and answer section on the lower bar of your Zoom menu. Or if you are in YouTube, you can use the comments section. We will be collecting the questions throughout the program, and we hope to get to as many of them as possible through the course of the panel. With that, please join me in welcoming Jason DeLeon, Raul Paz Pastrana, Isabella Alexander Nathani, and Naeem Mohamed for this panel on migration through the camera lens, ethnography, film, and the migration crisis. Thank you. Naeem? Thank you, Uzma, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And thank you to Matt Riley and the team at NYAS for putting this together. Really excited to be in conversation with Jason, Isabella, and Raul about their films and their books. 
and also to be in conversation with the audience that's here through the Q&A portion of the program. Uh, one of the things that we thought we would do at the beginning of the event is to show the trailers for both films in questions and two images from or related to Jason's book because many of you might have received the email with the links for the films over the weekend. You might have seen it Saturday or Sunday um, and it being Monday evening. We thought it'd be nice to refresh our memories and just be in the same space of the visual images and also to sort of get us going to be reminded of the films. So I'll briefly show the trailers of the two films and two images from Jason's book and then we'll uh, get into the conversation. So I'll start with this image from Isabella Alexandra Nathani's book, Burning at Europe's Borders, which is the book from Oxford University Press, which is also the inspiration for the film. The cover image you see here of an ID card being burnt, uh, Republic Guinea um, can be vaguely made out, is from one of the scenes in the film, but also is the cover of the book. And it's worth considering how a book becomes a film or becomes an inspiration for a film. And we'll see in the case of Jason and Raul how the author of a book becomes a central character in a film. So here is a trailer from The Burning, the untold story of Africa's migrant and refugee crisis directed by Isabella Alexandra Nathani. <laughs> While the world's attention has been focused on Syrian refugees, 20 African people die every day trying to reach Europe. Over the last three years, I've been beaten and jailed by authorities, trying to stop me from filming families as they risk everything to escape hunger and violence. All the people that are here, you are seen in the forest, we are having the same intention. For every migrant who makes it to Europe, 49 others die trying. For these families, hope for the future is greater than fear of the present. It's time for their stories to be told. 
Si Dieu fait que tu vas mourir dans l'eau, tu vas mourir. Je suis miel. Mais que Dieu t'aide. From Isabella Alexander Nathani's film, uh, inspired by her book, we turn to Jason de Leon's book, The Land of Open Graves, Living and Dying on the Migrant Trail, a project that features uh, Jason's research and photographs by Michael Wells. And I want to show just one photograph uh, from this book, one by Michael Wells, United Colors of Benetton, BK3 site. Uh, this is a key focus of the book, uh, tracing the remnants of migrants and also tracing the remnants of death. And this backpack photo partially may be an inspiration for this installation that happened at Parsons School of Design in 2017 as part of an exhibition called Estado de Excepción or State of Exception. Uh, these are a collection of backpacks found on the trail of death along the desert. From Jason's book, we turn to Raul Opaz Pastrana's film, Border South, which features three distinct chapters. Chapter one is the survivor, chapter two is the anthropologist, and chapter three is the trail. And in chapter two, the anthropologist is Jason de Leon. ¿Cómo le hacen lo, los inmigrantes para dormir en los días? ¿Se acuestan? A ver. Te <laughs> otra posada, es que güero te va a salir cara esta güero. El chile te lo digo. Ahorita no me importa el combiótico. Un par de chelas que son las que ando unas toñas, sofocado. Unas toñas importadas. Unas toñas. Si no quedamos, bueno, yo mi mañana así, con mi ropa. Te quedas. Y te pones la cobija, lo que viene. Ahorita la cabeza. Hoy es el tren. Cuando viene, se viene a vía el, un, ¿cómo te podría decir? Como un, una vibración. Y si se te hace la cabeza así, ya sabes que viene de donde venga, de largo, ya te despiertas, ya sabes que ya viene el tren. ¿Se escucha? Ya te tiras un pedo, güero, que se escucha. <risa> ya estaba grabando. ¡Ah, la grande! <risa> A mí ya me habían advertido que eso estaba horrible, no usaba lo mismo, pero sin embargo, el, como siempre, el inmigrante es terco y hasta que no se da cuenta él mismo, porque como lo que está. Entonces, hasta ese momento él nos dice: Ah, sí, tenía razón. Contamos con la presencia de Gustavo Dios, que hace aproximadamente dos meses, fue baleado, estuvo en el hospital alrededor de tres semanas, eh, sufrió eh, el perforado del pulmón. Puedes tomar dos decisiones, irte en tren o irte caminando. Ahora tomamos una decisión de, de darle caminando. Porque la verdad que el retén allá los está poniendo duro. Uno sale con Dios, pero Dios lo que cuida es el alma de uno. Pero lo físico, lo que le vaya a pasar, Dios no nos protege allí. I would like to now invite 
Isabella Alexandra Nathani, Jason De Leon, and Raul Opaz Pastrana to join me on screen. Hi, Isabella, Jason, and I believe we're waiting for Raul to come up on camera. Jason, I see your musical instruments in the background that made an appearance, of course, in the film. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Raul, are you able to turn on your camera? Uh, no, it doesn't. It says I can't. Okay, now I can. Let's see. The, the filmmaker. Okay. I was waiting for the host. <laughs> There's no such thing as a Zoom conversation without at least yeah. one technical glitch, and I've already contributed the one for this evening. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it wouldn't seem normal if there wasn't a little hiccup. So thank you, all three of you, for joining us. We have a unique configuration, I think, between uh, books and films, books that leak into films and vice versa. So those are my interests as well. So hoping to have a fantastic conversation about all of that. Um, I have a couple of um, conversation starters that I want to share, but then we can also discard those as the conversation proceeds. And at some point I will uh, want to show one clip, clip each from each of your films again, when we get into the conversation about the role of the maker, the anthropologist and the role of activism. So we'll come back to that. Uh, maybe I'll start with um, a word and a theme that actually even appears in uh, the trailers, uh, the question of time. Um, you know, at least one of the migrants says, you know, rather have uh, future hope than stay in this time. And this, um, this idea of time, uh, an idea of a specific kind of time that migrants inhabit, whether migrants going through perilous sea journeys or land journeys, whether those who finally managed to get a visa or those who are still in prison, you know, time is a major factor. And I'm influenced in this by um, a colleague of mine at Columbia um, who graduated from here, Sumayaka Samali, whose forthcoming book on migrants in Beirut called Black Beirut has this phrase. Um, she coined the phrase time of exhaustion, which she defines as an endless deferral of the future. Uh, then I'm also thinking of the filmmaker and friend Armando Crodonaveda's recent film, Yame Voy, or I'm Leaving, which is about a man who keeps dreaming of the time when he'll return to Mexico. Um, in your films, a passage of time is often indicated by events. Um, so we have the forest camp, we have the lifeboat, we have the walking through the desert, but also things happen. You know, a person finally gets his visa and then loses it is again. A person is in prison, Isabella goes to find them and then finds uh, terrible news. There's always this movement and almost like an endless time. We see people get older in your films. Um, in particular, Isabella, it's marked how they're getting taller and starting to look different and you know, Fino says he is now the old Fino as opposed to the young Fino. So, and then all of you are on journeys, right? Isabella, you, your voiceover told us that it was a five-year process. Uh, Raul, I presume also similarly long, Jason's book talks about the traces left behind over time. And then of course, in the film, there's that chilling shot at the end where you start to see the vultures eating at the carcass, which is also how you, you know, which is how you're trying to measure how long it takes for a body to disintegrate, right? Um, so I wonder if we could start by talking about how migrants, especially in these perilous journeys, experience time and how you've experienced that journey while working with them. Um, there's no particular order in whoever wants to go first, but perhaps I'll first turn to Jason, since your book specifically was also about tracing the afterlives of the residue of the journey. Well, thank you um, so much for for putting us into this conversation. Um, you know, <clears throat> the question about migrant time is one that I have written about, struggled with, um, and I've sort of thought of. I, I think I've 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 thought of migrant time in a kind of variety of different ways. Um, there is the sort of stasis I think that migrants find themselves in um, with you know, people sort of think about border crossings as something that occurs, it, you know, it's just a matter of crossing a geopolitical boundary and then suddenly it's over. But in fact, there can be many months leading up to that crossing. There can be many months after that initial crossing and people get deported, get sent back. Um, there's lots of waiting for a crossing to happen. And so you, you it's not uncommon to meet migrants who, who talk about, um, you know, they've been in a shelter for three years, but they still call themselves a migrant. They're still in movement, even though that they're actually quite, they're, they're actually quite stationary and in some ways are, um, you know, creating a life. I think with like Gustavo, there, it's, it's a good example of he's sort of migrating, but at the same time you find him working, you know, these like these 
put these occupations that to keep him in a place for for extended periods of time um but yet in fact you know he's sent back again um and then this whole thing um sort of starts over so i think there's there's always kind of that migrant time for me there's the issue of deportation and how that kind of feeds into this um, circle I don't do much that much work on deportation. It's part of the whole process. But um, like I have a, a, a current graduate student at the University of Michigan, Amelia Frank Batali, who works on issues of deportation and this idea that um, it is part of this kind of longer clock that migrants, um, you know, have to kind of recalibrate. I mean, they have to recalibrate time, I think, to to adjust for this this incredibly long sort of um, social process. And so I think also as anthropologists, we've had to do that too. Um, to get a sense of, okay, these are the tempos at which people move at, and um, they can speed up, they can slow down, um, and so it sort of does this, and we have to figure out ways to then adjust our methods to deal with that. And then finally, I would say for me, the, the kind of third form of migrant time revolves around death. Um, and at least in the case of, you know, like maybe the, you know, case like the Mediterranean, um, the Sonora Desert of Arizona, you know, you've got migrant death occurring um, and people disappearing and that then prolonging the kind of mourning process. And so I, I would I would argue that much of the mourning that happens for migrants who disappear um, is this kind of once again a recalibration of, 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 of time, but one that I think is so brutal. And for me, that's probably the, the, the worst part of this um kind of recalibration is the fact that for a lot of people, thousands of families, you know, they don't mourn and then bury someone. Um, they are are kind of stuck in limbo for potentially forever where this thing just keeps kind of going. And so for me, that's kind of this other part of the migration process that um, that really just prolongs this whole this whole thing. Jason, your um, work as it also features in Raul's film, and maybe I can turn to Raul for this. It's also about how long it takes for things to disintegrate, right? And that is the idea that uh, is the idea there that things happen sooner than people expect and therefore the absence of bodies is it actually doesn't mean anything because things can disintegrate that fast. That was a part of the film, Raul, where I felt, you know, we're often both in your film and Isabella's film in time that seems to never end. Um, and then there suddenly also with the vulture sequence and the whole process of, you know, having a cadaver stand in for a migrant body as a way to do forensic analysis also things seem to be speed sped up it was suddenly accelerated Raul if you could talk about that a little bit yeah well in the film there are three times the three stories in their own time space uh, space and time uh, Jason story is like more of a a person looking at the whole thing as, as far as, as as he can with all the information that he's got and the migrants living in a and the, where they have to make decisions in a second. So, uh, and I try to make it very different in that sense. So it's uh, time and space works differently when you're looking back and you're, you're able to make experiments uh, for things that you have studied and you can measure. Well, when you're on the trail, you know, like with Gustavo or the Echoes, the, the third, uh, they are, their time is decisions in one second. So they're living a different time space, I would say. Um, and, and, and I think uh, that that's sort of a, that's sort of what I would answer that on the film itself. I mean, uh, I, and that's something that that's how I was playing out uh, the archetype of of this person that has the time to reflect with the people that don't have the time to reflect, and they have to make these decisions. On the, and then they meet at the end, sort of the two times meet when Jason goes and and talks to them in, in the shelter. Um, so I don't know if I answer your question about time, but that's how I, I structure in the film. Uh, each one, each story had their own time and space. Gustavo, I mean, we'll come back to him, but Gustavo also seems extraordinarily calm at times, like not in a rush. It's almost, especially when he's sort of had to go back to, you know, when his visa's expired, he's in front of your camera, but just seems to be moving at an incredibly slow pace because it's almost like signaling that nothing much is going to happen now until I get whatever is the next stage. Um, Isabella, in your film, um, you tell us uh, at a certain point that it was five years, and we also see um, you know, in particular, of course, very sharply we see it with Bambino, where you almost follow him from first getting to know him, and he's a young person. And at that point, we're not really clear that that's a primary that is going to be a person we'll keep following because they're, we're meeting so many people. And then you meet him again, um, and then, of course, um, but then also other fates happen. You actually end up, and it's of course a different trajectory. You know, the one from North Africa to Europe, but you end up following some people till 
they've finally arrived at sort of a safe refuge, right? Even though they still might be in limbo as females. Could you talk about that process of following them and also for so many years? Yeah, so the filming for the project took place over, over the course of five years. Um, and, you know, over the course of that time, there, there were three uh, families, we'll call them, three groups of individuals that were being followed. Um, you know, their journeys represented all of the possible ends that, that can come for people on this migratory route from various points in Africa to Europe, meaning that some made it successfully across the Mediterranean and are now somewhere within the EU, um, either documented or, or undocumented. Um, some of them are back at their starting point, so back in the DRC in Sierra Leone in Mali, where I first began journeys with them. And then many of them remain in that in-between space in North Africa, in prisons, in these hidden forest camps, or in various uh, forms of, of working camps that we see in Algeria and Libya. Because so many of my subjects were so young, um, you know, some of them three and five years old, uh, five years is an enormous amount of time. We, we see them grow up on screen. Um, you speak about, you know, Bambino, who's 12 years old when we first meet him and has traveled by himself across five countries to reach Morocco. And then sort of as, as a counterpoint, we have Fino, who's been stuck in the same space that Bambino enters for now 17 years, trying to make it to the other side. Um, I think similarly to, to Jason, I, I think a lot about what time means in this space. And in fact, in a lot of my written work, I'm applying this concept of liminality that, that we see a lot in anthropology as sort of a lens for exploring what, what migration means. Um, the burning, which is something that you see in, in the title of both the, you know, the book project and the film, um, the burning is, is, you know, has multiple meanings here in this space. It references the physical burning of one's identity papers, you know, before they leave home in hopes of avoiding repatriation. And this is the term that's given to illegal migration in North Africa. So the Arabic word for illegal migration translates to, to harig, which means to burn. Um, and these, these individuals are referred to uh, in derogatory slang as burners. So illegal migrants um, are called burners in this space. But we can also think of it as individuals who have made an active decision to burn their past lives in hopes of reaching some future on the other side. Um, when in reality, so many of them end up stuck in between a past and a future life. And so what does it mean to have these extended undefined periods of time that are spent in spaces where, where you don't exactly fit into either your, your former identity or what you imagine may be you know, your, your future identity. So I think, I think a lot about that and about how in these spaces in North Africa where the vast majority of, of migrants and refugees end up trapped, um, there's always this duality. You know, they're, they're hiding, but they're actively being hunted by the police and military forces in the area. You know, they're both invisible in terms of our international human rights laws and yet hyper visible, you know, constantly being searched out, being, you know, attacked um, by, by those who, who are seeking to stop their journeys. So I think that, that time exists in both senses, um, both urgently, you know, for those who are there and, and whose lives are, are in constant danger and also this sense of, of, of time sort of ceasing to exist because there is no end to the state of liminality. You know, just um, talking about this act of burning the papers, the first time I heard about this actually was um, an old case, the Iranian man who was stranded in a French airport and had destroyed his papers, therefore they couldn't deport him anywhere. That's the first time I actually heard of this idea that if you have no papers, there's nowhere to be deported. And it's the first time I'd heard about it. It's almost 15, uh, 20 years ago. And now I suppose it's it's a knowledge that's passed through all these networks. Everybody knows that to be safe, actually, you need to destroy papers. And then it's an interest contrast to what happens when you actually get there, right? In Raoul's film, that uh, visa that he finally gets is so precious that his family or friends take a photograph and frame it at the party for him. Um, you know, I'm personally an immigrant to the United States and I became naturalized in 2015. And I remember when the passport arrived by mail, it, I was expecting it to somehow be spectacular, but it just document in a plain envelope that also looks like a credit card mailer. So, but then this is a super precious document that then you make sure you don't lose. So migrants once inside and legalized whatever term you might want to use, 
you know, that paper is really precious, right? Because it took so much to get it. But on the way, you have to destroy all traces. And I'm thinking now also of, you know, you have various men um, who express questioning about their decision to leave. And I, I wonder how much more is there besides a legal aspect to this decision to destroy all remnants of a previous identity. I think you even have one person who says, oh, that's not my name, that's my name. At some point he corrects you or corrects somebody else. And I wondered if that was also about paperwork or something else. Um, Isabella, if you, if you have any more thoughts about that or not to put you on the spot on that. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I, I thought the question was for real. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think about how that seems like you're saying in the beginning, like the necessary step that the burning of the identities, which, you know, we can expand that and imagine what it means to burn everything that materially proves your existence. Of course, you know, one example of it is burning your, your national ID card of some form or, or your passport if you had one. But we can also think about burning you know, bank documents, burning marriage licenses, burning any kind of diploma or certification that you had, everything that we, you know, attach so much value to in life and saying, I'm, I'm risking throwing all of this away, becoming non-existent as an individual so that I can reach some, you know, future personhood. Um, but I think what, what you're hinting at is also the power that comes with that move, right? That's not my name, this is my name. Um, I would also say that's not my age. This is the age I want to be in this particular circumstance or I'm not from that country, I'm from this country. Um, and I think it'll come up in some of our, our later questions but there um, can be an enormous power in reclaiming the ability to manipulate your identity and to know at what point on your journey a particular identity will be most valuable. So at what point in your journey do you need to be a minor? Um, at what point in your journey do you need to be instead presenting yourself as an able-bodied man who can work? Um, at what point is being from a country that the United Nations recognizes as a country that's currently at war, your only hope at survival? Mm -hmm. um, and so we can think of, of this burning as also an act of, of reclaiming control over your story in spaces where individuals are often stripped of any ability to, to, to assert their humanity. Right. By the way, speaking of stories and this is what it is and this is what not it is, there's a fascinating interplay in your film where every time you interview an official who says, oh, there's no war there, you immediately cut to a scene of war footage and then the year tells us 2012 to present. And that's how you don't necessarily interrupt the person on camera, but you go, wait, that looks like a war is going on. And there's this whole, it's all these officials trying to convince everybody that there's no war going on. It's very stable. So these are all uh, economic migrants. Uh, and then maybe I can go from that idea of the stories people are presenting in order, the stories people are presenting in front of officials to the stories people are sharing among each other, um, both in burning and also in uh, border south, because um, in both films, the stories that migrants are sharing with each other are both signposts of where they are and where they're going, and also small droplets uh, of hope when things are looking really bad, you know, especially with, for example, some of the train journey. So in Border South, we see a man um, uh, who is making a very complicated sculptural toy that also looks like a fan or a palm tree from beer cans that he's gradually cutting. And he tells us he wants to pretend he is a street vendor, not a migrant. And then you have Gustavo telling the story of La Llorona uh, and then says, what stories do you have in your area? And the person who's preparing the food says, oh, there's Malinche who seduces men. Uh, and then she says, oh, and then Malinja becomes a snake in order to punish the flirts. So it's a mythology about, you know, uh, male-female relationships and the idea of faithfulness, etc. And then you have um, in the burning, the child who is told, oh, your father is just gone to God and then he will come back. And the child says, no, I don't believe in that. Uh, so then I, what I was struck by while watching both films is, and maybe it was there and just didn't make it into the edit. Um, I didn't hear mythologies or stories about the border agents, right? They were actually presented when talked about as just you know, border security, um, either in uh, Europe and North America or in Mexico. Um, and I wondered if there are stories you found um, about mythologies that people are creating that somehow put a face to these border guards, maybe anthropomorphize them somehow as figures that migrants should be escaping or evading. Um, you know, I thought of the, you know, the figure of the trickster in anthropology and was just recently uh, for my class talking to my students about uh, African-American folklore about, about Br'er Rabbit. And the idea with Br'er Rabbit is always that he outwits much stronger forces, 
but because he's not as strong and knows strength is not what's on his side, he uses his wit. And the stories about Brad Rabbit are always about how clever he is, even though the other side has all the weapons or the teeth or whatever else. So I just wonder, Jason and Raul, whether you came across um, you know, stories that people constructed, mythologies that they constructed around these people who frankly are the really the only barrier besides, of course, the desert and um, the hardships of the desert. The guards are the wall that prevents them from entering. I wonder if there were stories that they tell about them, mythologies, their structure that you found in either the book, Jason or Raul during the filming. We didn't spend much time filming agents um, in Arizona, partly because that was we were sort of winding down what was happening there. And Raul and I started working really when, right around the time that, that we began a new project on the Guatemala-Mexico border. Um, and at that time, you know, we were sort of dealing with Mexican agents, immigration agents and uh, other various officials who had just gotten an influx of money um, from the um, U.S. government um, and from the Mexican government to start to crack down on Central American migration. And so um, we were sort of there at the beginnings where um, I think corruption was really starting to ramp up and, and human rights abuses were, were starting to, to ramp up. Um, and it's com completely horrible now. Um, but kind of coming out of the transition from sort of Arizona to to Mexico, I guess the discussion is always in, in Arizona, migrants complain about Latino Border Patrol agents. Like, his, like they're known to be the worst. Um, they're the ones who will, who, will, who will berate you, who will treat you poorly. Um, and, you know, most migrants will say, you know, the gringos, the white guys are the ones, and they're, and they're mostly men, um, are typically the ones who, um, who are perhaps a bit more respectful. But there is kind of this idea that, that Latino agents are the worst of the worst. Um, and I would say from my own experiences dealing with Border Patrol in various um, ways, shapes and forms, that that's been my exact experience as well. I think in, in Mexico now, um, at, at the time that we were filming, you know, people were starting to realize that like these immigration agents were really were incredibly corrupt, were kidnapping, were extorting people. But really the biggest kind of boogeymen were the, the train guards. I mean, those are the ones that I think that were the kind of scariest and, and Raul spent more time sort of trying to understand that than, than I did. But, I, but you know, from, from everything I've heard at, kind of in those years, that those are the people who, would, who folks were the, were the most afraid of. Those are the biggest monsters. Mm. Interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I mean, our idea was never to really to focus on, you know, Border Patrol in the U.S. Uh, too much. It was mostly about uh, Type share, sharing the point of view of, of how migrants themselves react to things. Uh, in, in the case of, of Central America and Mexico, especially Central America crossing through Mexico, it's not just Border Patrol. It is, you know, the, the garroteros that Jason mentioned. There is, well, there's military, there is gangs, there are cartels, there are local communities who also prey on them. Um, it, there are like there are a billion or no more industry where everybody take, takes advantage of migrants. So it's uh, they have to like uh, it's not just one boogeyman. Uh, and then there is there is also nature. Um, so it's it's just uh, I think when you you can focus on any of those and and give it their space. I, I feel uh, for a, for a book maybe you can have more space for a film. The, the the ones that Jason mentioned, the, the ones in the, that are on the train, they got, as we call them, garroteros. Those, are, those were scary mostly because they were in a space where the, they were taking over a cartel because of laws that change. And I, I don't want to get into much into that. They are very linked to the US. Um, but they were in a space where they were like private and government and they could get away with a lot of things. They, they, will, they were killing and they still are, but more back then, a lot of migrants crossing from Veracruz to Mexico City. And uh, people, the migrants who survived, they just move on or they were buried. And Gustavo happened to survive. So we happened to get a, a little insight of that story. And, and the reason why is also because we wanted to, to, to tell stories that were happening present tense and trying to find out all these other things will make a different film. And we wanted to stay more on the poetic parts of the film rather than to over explain things. 
So we just that we happen to be able to tell the story because of Gustavo and he was there. But if if that hadn't been the case, and that even that wouldn't have making it. So uh, yeah, and I mean to me, uh, I I see the migrant trail as a big big. Uh, I mean, as an immigrant myself, but listening to the stories from families and friends, uh, I see the migrant trail as a, as a huge beast, as a huge uh, ecosystem. Uh, and that is impossible to define as much as we try. It's impossible to control and that we are all sort of part of it. And I wanted to show that machinery as much as I could uh, uh, in the film. So, so it, it, is, it, is, it, it is impossible to like show everything, but I wanted to give it like a sense, like a, like a, a sprinkle of what it is underneath. And, and it was based a lot on sound. It was based a lot of how people react, how people do all the opposite of trying to uh, talking about like all oh, this border patrol do this to me was like today we're gonna share food the opposite of like uh being talking about because those stories are there but the opposite of talking about you know i got i got shot i got stopped by the i got i fell on the train we wanted to show i then doing other things like telling jokes uh things that actually build our spirit to the things which is which are the things that people tell you about um and, and that you need in order to cross one of the most dangerous routes in the world, uh, you need to have this sort of a, a mentality. And I, and I wanted to highlight more of that than, um, than the other part, which is overly highlighted, you know, like uh, the, the harshness of being hunted down or being killed, you know, we wanted to highlight more of the resilience of it in a ways that are, are rarely highlighted. And so Border Patrol, I mean, there are symbols there, and then I mean the the vultures in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, I use them as border patrol at the end. And there is a scene with border patrol right that we didn't include in the film, but you know they are there, uh, and and we just try to do it more on the poetic side rather than on your face. Um, but all of that is it's is there, but it's just subtle. The word subtle, I think that's the word. I mean, you do have that intense shot of the from below of the uh, masked men with guns walking across the train as one of the chilling scenes. So it's definitely there. And I presume that that's about as close as you could get to them. And then you go to Gustavo, who presumably is looking at them. And then you also make the connection. Because at that point, it's not 100% clear who has shot Gustavo. And you understand from his look that these are the men that shot him. That's how all this happened. And you can that's the only time where he looks a little bit angry and perhaps also anger from safety because he's with all of you. Um, and then in um, Isabella's film, of course, there is a person who speaks in the car in detail and quite frankly, and his face is pixelated. And there's also this strange, um, I think, US Air Force command person um, who's on phone and saying all sorts of things. And I know, Isabella, that my first thought was, does he know he's being recorded because he's being uh, very relaxed? Um, and then at some point he tells you to continue the story. Um, and then I'm, I'm sort of connecting a couple of things. What Jason said earlier about your own experience and the reputation that the uh, Latinx members of the border guards might be the most uh, troublesome or ferocious. Um, this is making me think of, um, two other films. Uh, one is Bernardo Ruiz. He has a documentary called Kingdom of Shadows in which it has a slightly similar structure of chapters that look at two sides. Uh, but the Homeland Security Guard that that film focuses on is a Latinx man um, and you know, kind of very proud of his job. And the other thing I'm thinking of is a science fiction film by Alex Rivera called Sleep Dealer. Um, which is a future where you don't have to cross the border, etc. You just plug into these machines. But in that one, the man who uh, is in the fighter pilot jets that ends up bombing his own family's village is a Latinx man. So this is also a theme that comes up. Um, and so then I'm thinking there's the familiarity, right? Um, like intimate community that might actually end up policing their own community. And perhaps as Jason was pointing to, might need to be even more fierce in order to prove their credentials perhaps, right? That I'm not compromised. Um, and I don't know to what degree, Isabella, you were able to get a sense of what the backgrounds were of the guards there. Uh, but I'm also connecting this with, um, you know, anthropologist Laura Nader's um, exhortation for us to study up, you know, study the um, apparatus of power and the people who are in power. And so I do wonder for a future project what it would look like um, to study, you know, the actual people inside these things. And then I'm wondering also, if in your mind, uh, whether Joshua Oppenheimer's film, Act of Killing looms in any way, because Act of Killing is a film that was, that it was embroiled in controversy precisely because the entire film is giving time to the uh, 
uh, alleged killers of the Indonesian um, mass killings. And a lot of people said, well, you shouldn't give them so much screen time. I don't know if that factored in any way, whether the, or whether it will in future films, because I personally am really curious, intrigued, uh, worried about the inner lives of um, people who work in these spaces, but it seems perhaps it's, we stay away from it in film. I don't know if that's because of access. Um, I mean, Isabella, you're, you did have actually access in the end to two people, it seems. Could you tell us more about those two people? One asked for his face to be pixelated, the other one only spoke to you on the phone. Right, so um, one of the individuals you're referencing was a sergeant with the Guardia Civil which is um, an EU funded military police force that works primarily in the Spanish enclaves that are located in Northern Morocco called Malia and Ceuta. Their primary mission is to control those borders and to push back uh, African migrants and asylum seekers there. Um, this was an interesting character. He, he actually ended up um, leaving the Guardia Civil shortly after um, I, I began interviewing him. And there was a time when, you know, we did extensive interviews together. There was a time when I considered making him and his character a more prominent one in, in the film and sort of tracking his own journey alongside those of the migrants who, you know, he had been pushing back in his official capacity. And it didn't feel like that story deserved to be told alongside the, the other three. I didn't feel like that was the right place for it. Um, you know, in thinking about this, you know, the, the earlier question you'd asked about myths that are created around these characters, um, which I did not find to be the case um, in terms of the officers who were actually guarding the borders there. I didn't ever come across any mythologies that had, that had you know, evolved along with their role there, but that was certainly true for the smugglers and the different smuggling rings that controlled the spaces. And each smuggler had sort of this larger than life persona that they had accumulated over the course of time um, in terms of, you know, the ways in which they had interacted with the people who they were moving from place to place. Um, and a, a project that I'm currently working on now, which is sort of grew out of the burning is, um, is, is working with one uh, smuggling ring that's one of the largest in North Africa and exploring these very complicated um, roles that, that these individuals play in this space. Um, you know, I'm sure everyone, you know, joining us today can imagine all of the, the negative stereotypes that we would associate with, you know, the smuggler. Um, but I also look at the ways in which, in, you know, in some of these spaces, they play more compassionate roles. Um, they are often members of that community um, who, after so many years, failing to make the migration themselves, decided to profit off of the knowledge that they had accumulated along the migratory route. So this idea of a kind of us versus them, I find in practice really doesn't exist. It's often members of the own community who are kind of stepping up and then, and, and then have these lives in their hands and often at the end of the day are making difficult decisions that come down to human life versus profit. Um, so the other, the other individual that you mentioned um, in your question is, um, one of the commanders for actually the, the U.S. Military, military Special Forces Unit in Africa. Um, and he comes in as sort of an advisor um, mentoring me, giving me advice about going back into these spaces and the ways in which I can sort of navigate everything that I'm up against in trying to complete this film um, and, and, and get it done and get the story out. He, he warns you at some point that making somebody disappear in Africa is nothing early on, I think. Yeah, um, you know, we, we would have, you know, he, he's lived and worked in this region for, for decades now, and we would have conversations before um, the shoots, depending on the spaces that I was going to be working in, um, him having a very intimate knowledge of, of all of the obstacles that the migrants are up against, but also that people, you know, attempting to do research and to get out of that space with stories to tell are up against. Fascinating. Um, I want to turn a little bit to the forms of this work. Um, and then I want to come back uh, to these two sides, multiple side protagonists, uh, which is that, you know, Isabella, you have a book and you have a film. They are perhaps in par parallel, perhaps sequential. The title has a similarity, but different audiences, um, you know, um, Oxford University Press. I presume that it will be in libraries and universities, but not necessarily uh, mass paperback or maybe it will be the film will of course travel um, in some ways 
in a different way. Um, Jason, you had the book, but you had made the decision to have the book be accompanied by these beautiful um, black and white photographs. Then there was the exhibition at Parsons and elsewhere. And then of course, in Raoul's film, you appear um, in chapter two as anthropologist, um, who is a quiet presence and then gradually starts speaking but isn't, for example, a voiceover. So um, one of the things that might be useful to think about is, you know, how is making a film around these topics from your research notes or at the same time as your research notes, how is it a different form of research than the writing um, that you're also doing at a different pace and with a different audience? Uh, you know, how does film research differ from writing about it? You know, how does the viewing also differ? Um, I'm thinking of this um, sort of foundational uh, idea and myth in anthropology of the ethnographer who is so skilled that they kind of disappear into the background, right? I mean, in the Balinese cockfight, we are given the impression that the anthropologist is so much ignored, almost a ghost that people go about their business. So what you see is the phenomenon as is without any alteration by the person arriving. But of course we know that's never the case, whether through the work of Laila Bulogod or others who said that our arrival immediately changes the scenario. So then everything gets one more layer when it's a camera, right? Because, um, uh, you know, the word participant observation already suggests that we are, we are going to participate, but then also sometimes we, sign paperwork or make arguments that we won't participate or we won't alter. And these are sort of very slippery terrain. With the films, which I'm really considering extension of the book, Raul, Jason meeting together, making a film, Isabella writing and then making a film, or as I said, in parallel, um, but the film does other things, right? For example, um, Isabella in the scene where you're embracing Bambino, one of the things I noticed, of course, is the shadow that cuts through and you can see the camera shape on it. And that made me immediately think, oh, I wonder if there's somebody else there and whether that changes the dynamic or not. Of course, there's a camera there, but we notice it. And then we also notice you, right, as standing out. Um, you know, you're very much, not very much, but you're on camera sometimes and sometimes not. And then it all makes sense when you are arrested in Algeria and go through a terrible experience of your visibility. Um, and then Jason is uh, very much a presence um, in a different way, um, doing his research, but not speaking directly to the camera. So I'd like to talk about this level of direct involvement where you are also the researcher who's also at some point becomes the protagonist, both Jason and Isabella. And maybe just to um, familiarize the audience with what I'm talking about and with your permission, I'll just quickly show um, two clips uh, from your films that will just remind um, what I'm talking about. So I'll just switch to sharing screen and show the clips quickly. What I want to put out here is almost a style in the, well, in the middle of the mountain, like before. So we see it in one hour. OK, bye bye. Lo que quería hacer, bueno, es, es uh, hablar un poquito sobre las cosas que estábamos uh, uh, haciendo allá en Arizona y, y las cosas que estamos planeando. Y fuimos a, a la oficina en Arizona y me, me dijeron que, que no, no tienen nada de, no hay ningún caso allá que, que parece de José. Tenemos una carpeta que está lleno de información de él y ellos tienen la copia también. Y, Estamos um, esperando a ver si ellos pueden encontrar algo, pero para nosotros yo creo que es mejor a, a trabajar, a, a continuar a, a hablar con la, lo, todas las personas que podemos. Les prometo que no vamos a parar en eso, entonces todavía. Ya les sueño a veces que llega, que ya le encuentro. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Sí, sigue pasando el tiempo y es duro para nosotros, la verdad, porque sin saber nada. Pero bueno, ahí le damos con la ayuda de Dios. Tenemos que seguir en adelante. Te le agradezco mucho por lo que no se olvida que sigue usted. Me sigue ayudando, pero como dice 
como digo, tarde que temprano se abra algo, algo bueno, ¿no? So that's from Border South uh, with Jason in two scenes. And then this is from The Burning. Even the fortunate few who survived the crossing to Spain know that over 90% will be sent back to North Africa. The rejection rate for African migrants seeking refuge is higher than any other. In the Spanish enclaves of Malia and Ceuta, many aren't even given the chance to apply for refugee status. In my last visit with Bambino there, I learned that he would be detained until his 18th birthday, still five years away. Bambino! <laughs> oh, I'm so happy. I've passed the night, the last night, I've passed some nights, I've passed some stars with the brothers. The night, he's in Belgium. Yes, I think. You're going <laughs> he's still small, but he's already taller than Isabella in this scene. And then this is later. La mayor parte de los menores sufren malos tratos, desamparo, abandono, extranjeros, expulsiones de la ciudad, deportaciones ilegales. Son ciudadanos negros. Son forma parte de ese grupo de subsaharianos que saltan la valla, que son rechazados automáticamente, ilegalmente, o guardias los rechazan, los gran ejército marroquí, sin preguntarles cómo se llaman, qué edad tienen, si eres zombie porque han pedido asilo. ¿no? Oh, excusez-moi, madame. Cet enfant était detenido en dans votre centro de detención. Je lui ai rendu visite ici. No te puedo dar información de nada. Por favor, no puedes grabar. Prohibido grabar. Other details. There's some by the guard's house. Chico, Chico. This is Chico. Yeah. Chico. 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 Yes. So the two scenes, uh, two short excerpts from The Burning and the one excerpt from Border South. Um, well, they not only show us uh, Jason and Isabella in front of the camera, um, you know, in the case of burning, you even see Isabella's feet first. And I remember the first time I saw it, I thought, huh, that's a different um, clothing than other people were wearing. And that maybe was even a clue as to what's about to happen. Um, they're both the anthropologist in front of the camera, guiding the action, visible, not, not receding at all. Um, Raul, of course, is the quiet presence behind the camera, but also very much there. But it, so it brings up the question of, you know, what's happening when you're so much in the story, but it also brings up the question of activist anthropology, right? The work that doesn't wait for the book to come out in order to change the objective conditions. Because when we first meet Jason and when we first hear Isabella's voiceover, we might feel that, okay, we're being guided in the story, but 
these will not become the primary protagonists. But soon we see Jason leaving his research space, which is more long term, you know, thousands of backpacks and objects that he's discussing everything's in, you know, Ziploc bags, which gives us an idea of not only forensic research, but slow research, perhaps. But soon we switch to Jason putting up missing posters, meeting with the family directly, which is the point where I thought, oh, this is something different happening from what I expected. You know, then you, um, Jason, speak to a group of migrants and you show satellite images of where bodies are being found. And, you know, it's to me clear, perhaps to all audiences, that perhaps the lesson is do cross but avoid these paths, or perhaps is giving a guideline on how. Uh, and then, you know, Isabella, you're directly involved in trying to find people, trying to get them out. You know, you're confronting the guards, the guards are telling you you can't film, your camera switches off, you get the clear sense of confrontation. You're hiding under, you and your camera crew are hiding under a bed at some point, and the sound is recording. And you can hear the police officer say, you have some Europeans here, you can't have Europeans, you can't have anyone who's white you can be here, but you'll create a problem. So, you know, you get the very clear sense that events are not just being observed, but they're being moved, right, by your actions, hopefully. I mean, in some cases, in the case of Bambino, perhaps the intervention was not soon enough. In the case of the family that you met, Jason, I don't know if there was ever a resolution. Um, and then I'm also thinking of another recent film, The Infiltrators by Christina Ibarra and um, Alex Rivera, which, you know, even suggests perhaps a, some sort of hacking of the immigration system by activists, in this case, undocumented immigrants who deliberately go inside the system so as to film. Um, and then, of course, the idea of objectivity is anyway always perhaps, you know, out the window, but I'd just like you to, you know, it's like a free flowing prompt for all three of you, uh, Raul, Jason and Isabella to reflect on this. Your position, you know, Raul as the person who's often there as a quiet presence of the camera, but of course, gradually building trust, Jason and Isabella, you know, your position as researchers who are becoming inside the story and your position as researchers who are also at a certain point having the ability to change the course of events and not saying at that point, no, for the sake of some halcyon objectivity, I'm just going to document, right? Which is a move that many researchers have made, but you didn't. Um, so I'd like to hear from you about this um, and where you see this kind of action going. Isabella, go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's so so many questions here for us to discuss. I, I just, I, I think I'll start first by saying I, I push back really strongly on this idea that there is objectivity in research, in social science research, in anthropology, in filmmaking. Um, I think I can combat this assumption of there being any objectivity by being overt about who I am in the space. And I think about when I'm teaching anthropology to students, how I always push them when we're reading a new text to think first about who wrote the text mm -hmm. and how that individual's race and age and gender and political status and various other factors, you know, including their history of work in the region and their relationships there are shaping the book that we're about to read. Um, in my own book, I start by explaining to readers that this is not the same book they would be reading had a man done the research, had someone from Morocco or Nigeria done the research. It's inherently shaped by who I am in the space. And the decision to have myself on screen, I think, makes it impossible for audiences to avoid those same questions and to be you know, intimately aware of the fact that, that the story is filtering through me as a filmmaker and, and as a researcher. Um, I think it connects to, to another point you raised about the decision that a lot of us have made to also include subjects of the film as, you know, active participants in the story making, um, which, which for me is another critical piece of it that, that I myself am, am, you know, transparent about who I am in the space, but also that those whose stories are, are being shared have a creative role um, on the team. And it's something I, I always strive to do in, in my film projects, especially in a project like this, where I'm working in a community that I have deep roots at this point. I've lived and worked in the region for over a decade, but a community in which in every sense, I am also an outsider. Um, and in a project like this, where, where I see myself as really just being a conduit to lift voices that are being marginalized um, at various levels and by various players. Um, it's it's important to me that that you know they have control over over the stories that that are being told. Um, I I think that 
that this kind of anthropology allows for, you know, you, you, you see the urgency um, in film in a way that's different than, than on the page. And, and I, I guess my hope is that audiences feel that urgency. So I don't necessarily think about there being a division between my role as a researcher, writer, a filmmaker, or a human rights activist. Those all feel intertwined to me in ways that are inseparable. And the goals for each of those projects remain the same. The goals being to you know, expand human rights, to expose racial inequality in our international human rights law. To me, I think the difference lies more in how the people on the other side receive it. So how is someone going to read research or who is that research even accessible to in the first place versus how are people going, going to receive a, you know, a film? Um, film, when, when tackling the exact same project in two different mediums and at the same time, you know, I was writing at the same time that I was filming, one felt to me like more of a meta study, whereas the film enabled me to really zoom in onto the individual lives and the impact that it has, you know, on these three families. Um, in ways that I think for audiences become more humanizing and, and ultimately more powerful. Um, you know, there's, there's something about focusing in on just a couple of individuals and staying with them for a duration of time, you know, for, for multiple years that enables you to portray these really, these, these whole complex individuals um, and you hit the highs and lows with them. You know, they're not just migrants. They certainly would not describe themselves as individuals who are trapped in crisis. This is their life, you know? And so you see people on the migratory route, but you also see people, you know, they're losing family members. They're falling in love. They're having children. They're celebrating, you know, anniversaries. They're, they're living their lives. Um, and, and I think that enables the audience to come away with a, with a deeper sense of identification. You see a piece of yourself or a piece of someone who you care about in those characters because they've become multidimensional and they're so much more than just migrants. Um, Raul, uh, you also, you know, you also did tell us as a migrant myself, I'm wondering how you see the activist role of these films, your role, you know, you, you don't appear before camera, but your presence is felt. Yeah, I guess when you st when I, I started this project because I don't like a lot of the immigration films that were out there, you know, mostly directed by white directors, and they did not portray immigrants the way that I experienced myself and that people that I my family itself. So I was looking around, and they were also poorly shot, poorly produced. They were like, I mean, you're it's pretty insulting when you do that, right? So I was like looking for a story that would allow me to use the art of cinema to do something poetic and beautiful. At the same time that I share stories that were not, that I saw in my community, but that they were not, you know, you always see the humility, uh, the humiliated and the hunted migrant, you know, immigration porn. And I'm like, it was just tired of that. So I was looking around and then I saw these brown anthropologists with an Afro talking about, uh, about uh, what he was finding on the desert. And it was pretty much the first time I see an academic talking about, or anybody pretty much talking about what he was finding on the desert as if he had discovered something incredible. He's like, wow, instead of saying, look at the poor migrants, how they are using the shoe or they're dying or like how they're being chased. He had like this shoe or this bottle of water. He's like, God damn, look at this ingenuity. Look how they're doing this bottle of water. Look how they're doing this shoe. Uh, look at the mythology of the bottle. They have the mountain in there so they don't get lost. Uh, look at what they leave behind. He was, he was like, he was very excited about it. So I was like, oh, I think that's, that's the person I got to talk to. And so I contacted Jason and Jason just like opened his research to me to pretty much do whatever I want. And, uh, and of course, of course, I, he shared a lot of, of the cuts, but I think to me, that's where it comes from. Um, when you talk about activism, I also wanted to show something that was beautiful and that was well done. And uh, and that I share parts of the migrant trail that are usually are omitted because they don't they're not newsy or they don't catch the New York Times attention or or things like that because you know I mean who cares how migrants eat or how migrants tell jokes to each other right you want to know how many how they look death in the desert right mm -hmm. so we wanted to, to do the opposite of that and to show that that resilience through their through through their ingenuity and through their humor and through their humanity and let them be the uh, the driving force. The other thing as an immigrant filmmaker, 
and like almost every film in, in immigration, you know, the experts usually they turn out to be white and in the background, they, they drive the film. So one thing I was gonna do, no experts and no white people in the film. And I think that that was one rule. The other rule was no music score. Just because I, I wanted it, people to feel uh, the sounds of the migrant trail. And, and so I, I think working with Jason, that was just fairly easy because I mean, Jason moves, moves around that way. And the, I mean, we discussed a lot of other things but that was my driving force to start this film in this way. And, and I think, uh, I mean, I stayed true from the beginning to the end to those things. Uh, that, that meant that I couldn't tell a lot of things, but I think the ones that we told were well done and they were like done in a, in a way that were a powerful where audiences, especially Central American audiences and other undocumented communities could see it and have seen it. Uh, when we show up Margaret Mead, uh, the New Orleans Film Festival. I mean, in New Orleans, uh, almost all of our audience was Central American. And I mean, one of them uh, came up after me because we stood there for a long time talking to, to people. And she's like, I, th I think we're fucking smart. We can do that. You know, like it was like they're seeing each other, not like they're usually portrayed. And I felt I feel that that's how they, they also see themselves. They see they don't see themselves as, you know, like uh, humility and hunter. They see themselves as fucking smart people that are doing something that nobody really can do, but that they're doing it. So that was the spirit of of the film and it will drive in the force. And the activism itself is just to show that to me uh, rather than, you know, to focus on the way. I'm sure Jason has more to it because uh, we, we talked about a lot of things. By the way, I just want to say that even though you don't have conventional scored music, you do have those lovely musical interludes. One is Jason's drum rocking out sequence. And then the other is that song where they sing, what is it? In this treacherous world, you wander without God or love because of the devil's lies. I just thought it was a beautiful song. So you they wrote, a little bit yeah. of pieces of that. They wrote that song themselves. It's actually a Tigres del Norte song that okay. they just redo on their own lyrics. But you know, that's the shit they do, right? Like you were talking about the, the, the thing about Gustavo putting his visa, his picture. He mm -hmm. actually did that himself. Nobody did it for him. And you know, those are those little things. Uh, with Jason, I mean, I mean, we have a lot of things that I didn't put in that Jason wanted me to put in, you know, like him changing diapers or him falling in the desert and showing him more vulnerable. And I think I already showed him vulnerable, but he wanted me to go far on that, just to show how someone who is viewed, because Jason is viewed as someone who, who knows his craft, also, I mean, cannot, couldn't save this kid, right? So, I mean, the migrant child is bigger than him, is bigger than, than, than all of us. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that was one. Jason, you carry your um, responsibility in your face in the film where there are moments where you know you're talking to someone it's quite heartbreaking to see that you know the dancer might not come but you have to keep going and then there's this you know we see your children twice and i remember thinking the second time that okay that might be the refuge that gives him the energy to go back out again the next day um could you talk about i mean especially the experience of having to be on a on an activist vision mission that you know might not yield results, you know, the putting up these posters, I, yeah, all of that. Yeah, I mean, I sort of think about um, anthropology in terms of, you know, we are always in the story, whether we want to believe it or not, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. And um, because we're always in the story, you know, one of the, one of the things I tell students is like, if you can be helpful, be helpful, um, you know, and, and I, and I always, when I read ethnographies, I always think to myself, if people are, are cryptic about the relationship with the people that they're writing about, my, my questions are always like, do these people actually like you? Are they lying to you to get you to leave them alone? Um, are you a total burden to them? And I really want to know about those relationships because they're so complicated. And, um, you know, the scene where, where I give this lecture, to migrants, I didn't actually want to give that lecture. I was forced to give that lecture by the nuns who run that shelter. And I was forced to do it because all of my students had been working inside of the shelter, you know, and they were their job for weeks before they did any interviews was just to do first aid, help people make phone calls, contact families, fill out asylum forms. Because I was spending pretty much all of my time outside with those guys who were doing tattoos, all of those smugglers who were that's part of this, this, this current project. Um, and so I wasn't even, um, in the shelter working with migrants at all. Um, but the nuns were so suspicious of why the person who was in charge was outside with all these guys who were just like smoking crack and um, robbing each other, why I was out there instead of being inside. So they kept saying to me, you need to go do something helpful inside so that they don't get 
increasingly suspicious about you know what it is you're doing um but i, I said okay if you think that's helpful I'm, I'm you know i'm totally happy to do that um i would argue though that my my most helpful time during that filming was these guys were as they were tattooing themselves and this guy had this big marijuana leaf that he had put on his arm and they were spelling out weed on the bottom of it but um it was wheat, W E E T. That's what everyone thought that was in English was wheat, and so I felt like I the one like my most helpful moment was changing that uh, T to a to a D, um, because a lot of like what I'm saying in that in that in the in the the lecture about you can die in the desert, a lot of those folks already know that, um, and nothing that I can say is going to change the fact that that they are in a caught between a rock and a hard place and are going to just are going to go no matter what. But maybe learning a little bit more, you know, can be helpful in the long run. Um, but I sort of take cues. I would never do that unsolicited, you know. So I, I, I sort of take cues from people saying to me, "These are things we want you to do that w- that would be helpful." Um, but in terms of like, you know, presence in the story, I sort of think about it now as each of these projects that I'm involved with has different requirements um, and sort of expectations about my own presence. And I think you know, sort of, and working over three different projects, like the first book, Land of Open Graves. That's sort of this, I mean, it's it's put out by a, an academic press. It's got, um, you know, it has to have kind of methodological and theoretical um, uh, sort of pieces so that I could get tenure at the University of Michigan. Those are things that like you have to have, these things have to be included in there for us to recognize this as a, as a piece of formal scholarship. Um, and so in that, you know, my voice is sort of, I'm the narrator in that book who's giving you the theoretical analysis, who's giving you the kind of methodological background, but who's increasingly present in the moments of my own kind of crisis or difficulties like should i be doing this thing i'm about to photograph a body so now that i'm 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 feeling bad about this whole moment or confused i want you to know that i feel bad about those things and that i'm I'm trying to work through it so that people know that you know these relationships that that i have with people and to the subject is incredibly subjective and one that i'm that I, i could never hide and be this like third person saying you know and then the migrant goes into the desert i mean that's just not how i experience it nor would i feel comfortable kind of um, you know, trying to mask it in that sense. With the film, now you've got a different role where now I'm not the narrator and you don't really know what I'm thinking. You're, I'm, I'm now, Raul's basically doing a participant observation about what I'm doing. And so he gets to pick and choose um, how people see me. And I don't have a lot of control over that. And the expectation is that I'm going to be, I'm going to be this sort of semi-silent character and I'm not the expert. I'm just someone who's part of this whole thing and you get to see certain things and hear certain things that we hope will help give you a sense of a, a bigger picture as well as my relationship to these to these issues like you know the anthropologist as this you know complicated kind of figure and then so then the third project that I'm currently working on is um, a trade book about smuggling and so now it's a character driven basically a you know a literary nonfiction that has these expectations um, which you know the the press and all the people who now the, the big machinery that comes when one has a, a a trade book contract i'm now required to like be this character who doesn't act in the third person of like here's this sort of novel and then apparently you know occasionally the voice of you know of god will come in and explain the kind of theoretical parts that you make sense of it you know that's not the book that i'm working on now and that's that would be a book that would be sent back to me by the press saying this is not, you know, this is not an academic book. This is not a trade book. Um, I mean, this, is, this is a trade book. And so now I have to play this character because I want I want to write a, a different kind of book. And so um, I have to kind of figure out then how, how does my voice kind of come into this as the anthropologist, as this person who's dealing with these conflicts to both help the reader along and understand what is happening, um, provide some contextual analysis um, but uh, but also to kind of show you what it is an anthropologist does, you know, um, without forcing you to read perhaps an ethnography that um, that would kill the narrative because I have other, these other kinds of expectations. And so, but for me, I for every single one of those projects, I just I come to it and go, okay, um, I don't have to do what I. It's not always the same, and um, you know, it's the different projects require different kinds of things. And so I'm I'm totally happy to be fluid in terms of my you know 
how I view anthropology, um, you know, write, writing a book that does not have a deep kind of theoretical commitment. I'm, I had to kind of be, be okay with that because that flies in the face of what I've been told to do for the last 15 to 20 years. And so now to say, well, I want to write, I want to, I want to make a different kind of thing um, that perhaps is more accessible, but then now I have to play a new kind of role and my voice has to, has to come in in a, um, in a different kind of way. Uh, Jason, while you were speaking, we got a question from William Mitchell and also another one for Isabella. I'll start with the one for Jason. Uh, William Mitchell asked, Jason, you tried to find out what happened to Jose. The follow-up is, what made you select Jose among all the other deaths that you must have encountered? Um, well, you know, like as, as Isabella was saying, there's something that happens when you pursue certain individuals. And for me, ethnography is is about these individual relationships that I have with people that through those deep connections, I mean, I could interview and I have, you know, I've interviewed hundreds of migrants for one to two hours and then that's it. That's my only kind of connection to those folks. And I can generalize about experiences in certain ways, but I can't get, get into other kind of, you know, deeper sort of aspects of those individual stories. And so w my approach my for the lo longest time was, okay, I've, I've connected with a certain number of people deeply and then it's through those individual stories that I hope I can kind of move from the micro to the macro, um, but but doing a kind of deeper ethnography of individual people. And so the story of Jose, um, you know, he he comes in, into my life because I found the the body of his aunt a year before he died. And so um, I find a body in the desert. Um, I work with the organization in Tucson, the Colibri Center for Human Rights, to identify um, this woman named Maricela Zaguipuya. Um, and then I connect with the family in Ecuador and in New York and elsewhere. And then a year later, the family comes to me and says, well, you helped us with this last thing. Um, we have a cousin now who's missing. Can you help us with this story? And so it was a completely, you know, kind of organic. And for me, it's all, it's always organic. Like who do I connect with? Who do I feel like, um, I can be really open with about my own kind of, you know, who, who can I most deeply connect with and who connects with me? And then those are the stories that I want to follow. Because part of it too is for me, ethnography is about the the energy and the excitement and the, the kind of, I don't know, personal growth that I get from, from connecting with people who I feel like um, I can commit to them and then perhaps they can commit to me and then some, and, and then out of that relationship, something something bigger can, can come out of that. But, but it all happens, you know, really organically for me. Great, thanks Jason. Um, if there are questions coming in now, so I'll switch to them uh, and put aside my own questions. Uh, there are two questions for Isabella which are linked. Jabesh Shorkar is asking, uh, uh, it took Isabella five years to gather the information for her film. Uh, my question is, did she migrate with the group of which she based her film on or like what was the process? Uh, and then Abdul Butt asks, what does the EU or other governments do with people who burn their identity? And he has identity within quotes. That is so odd to me, having zero identification. Thanks for those questions. Um, the first one, the film was shot uh, between beginning of 2015, wrapping up just, just in the last couple of months. Um, I was not on the ground consecutively for those five years, but made two trips um, each year, the shorter shoot being six weeks and the longer shoot being anywhere between four and six months. Um, I did journey with many of the individuals. Um, the journeys were not always linear as in, you know, beginning in their home country and ending in Europe. So there are three main families that are followed. Um, one of them, we did start in their starting point and, and travel to their eventual ending points. Um, another of the journey sort of started in the middle and so started in Morocco. Um, that individual ended up spending several years in various North African countries, Morocco, Algeria, and Libya, before eventually going backwards to the country where, where he was originally starting. And then I have one that, that I caught at the very end and sort of went back to the, to the beginning. So um, started at various points, but, but did spend time in each of the family's home countries, home communities with them, whether that was at the start or the end or the middle of of their journey. Um, I decided to um, focus on individuals with whom I already had deep relationships, people who I had known for many years. Um, and so because that was important to me, it meant that I picked up sort of wherever people were on their current journeys. 
um, rather than you know picking people who who were just starting out. I think it's also more representative of this sort of cyclical nature of migration in this space. So you know it's not something that necessarily starts at point A and ends at point B. It often um, over the course of many years returns you again and again to your starting point. Um, and you know as many people know, once you become a migrant, you will always be a migrant. So they feel that once they've left that home community, even those who will return to it and sometimes spend many years at various points in their life living in their home community again, there's been some disjuncture. They no longer feel like they're the same person who they were when they left. Um, the second question about what happens to individuals who have burned their identification papers, um, for the very few who make successful crossings and reach the EU. So in the space that I'm working in, this usually happens by one of two ways. It either happens by crossing the Mediterranean Sea and reaching mainland Europe, um, Greece, Italy, or, or Spain in most cases, or it happens by crossing the fences that are around the Spanish enclave. So a lot of people don't know that Morocco is still home to these two small Spanish enclaves. One's about four square miles and the other seven. Um, and it means that Morocco is the only place on the African continent where there's a land border to Europe. So these enclaves are surrounded by three rings of razor wire fences. And another way for individuals, especially individuals who no longer have the financial resources to afford the smuggling fees of crossing the Mediterranean, a way they can attempt to, to, to reach Europe is by scaling these fences. So in either case, the very small number of individuals who make it um, then have a choice. They can either attempt to sort of disappear, right, to evade any sort of formal processes of, of intake, uh, whether that be by, you know, local police or by the UN, um, or they can go and formally apply for asylum. Um, this decision is often made by sort of weighing what your options are. There are advantages that come with going this route of formalization, the advantages being that the, you may then be given um, asylum or some sort of temporary status, which would enable you to get a better job, would enable you to continue your education if that was a goal as it is for many of, of the younger migrants. It also enables you the freedom of mobility. So the ability to, to go back home and to visit people or to travel freely then across borders. So you're sort of weighing your odds. What are my chances of getting asylum if I go the formal route versus, you know, if I think those odds are really low, I might try to evade that process altogether, in which case I want to remain paperless without any documentation that would that would track me back to my home country. For the people who, um, who are given the chance to apply for asylum, um, it generally comes down to a short, about five minute interview with a UN caseworker um, who's, whose job is to determine whether or not you should be given one of those spots. The quotas are set by countries, the numbers are very low. So really their job is, is not to give asylum to as many people as possible, but to weed out as many people as possible because there are so few spots um, that, that, that will be given. Um, in those interviews, as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's often a decision about which, which story or which self you should present. And there's a knowledge that's passed between migrant families about sort of which, which narratives are most advantageous in that space. Um, as I'm sure you know, everyone here with us today can imagine factors like age and gender and race are, are extremely powerful in terms of determining who has uh, vulnerability, which is really what the UN caseworker is assessing. Um, they have a limited number of spots. They're deciding who in that instance is the most vulnerable. As the UN caseworker says in, in the film, um, you know, my job is to decide who's the most vulnerable among the vulnerable. And so an argument that I make uh, in, in the written work and that I hope comes across um, in this film project is that the criminalization of blackness that we see you know, on a global scale has made it virtually impossible for asylum seekers from certain world regions to assert their vulnerability. Um, we see that playing out in terms of numbers. So the rejection rate is 92% right now if you're coming from any place on the African continent that is even lower if you um, are male and if you are a, a minor, um, sorry, if you're an adult as opposed to a minor, um, so. Thank you, Isabella. Yeah. Um, I want to go to a question from one of my students actually, Amalia Mayorga asks, what is it like as a filmmaker to go through these experiences and have to maintain a level of distance from your work emotionally to be able to fully process what is going on? Is that distancing even possible? Is it needed? 
how does the act of separating yourself emotionally or not affect how you create your work, if that makes sense? Um, I'd actually like to turn to um, Raul for this one, because you talked about the necessity that you took on for yourself of making a different kind of film, and you spoke about your own experience of this thing. So do you feel it's necessary to have distance, whatever that might mean? One thing is about the cinematic style and, and the choices you make before starting the film. And once you start making a film like this one, um, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, there's, we can make a film about the bloopers of, of how people cope with this. I mean, I don't know, I cannot do that because Jason would probably <laughs> be like, don't, don't mention the bloopers, damn it. But uh, there, the, the things that, there are things that you gotta do for, I mean, I don't know, it's, it's, it's it's so person tense. It's very close, um, and and it's and it's heartbreaking. It was heartbroken back then because a lot of things that were happening was under the Obama administration. I mean, who started a lot of what's going on now, and it gets worse now with what's going on. And then you have this heartbroken when you when you don't see a lot of change, and when you are in it uh, and seeing th them happening, it's also um, I don't know. I, I like the approach of of how, of how it's called uh, hanging out. You know, hanging out. I think with with migrants sort of helped uh, me uh, uh, deal with all this stuff. You know, like sharing bread, sharing beer, sharing time uh, was one way to do it. Uh, and and then they, then again, then you have as a filmmaker, there's a difference a little bit with the writing, although maybe not. Is that you got all this footage that you have to look over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, a lot of it do't make it to the film, but it is it is uh it's stuff that you that you are that you are with it for every day for sometimes twelve hours a day so it, I don't know a lot of sometimes a lot of drinking sometimes I go for bike rides um but but you know at the same time I always have to remind myself of the privilege that I have of being able to have documents to be able to do this, and a lot of people who are going through this they don't have that that privilege you know they are stuck with that and and I remember, I don't know if uh, Jason was a tactical, because I don't know what happened to that, but when we were filming in Chiapas, um, Avi was doing that, uh, that experiment about the DNA changes through the, uh, what happens from when they start in Guatemala and how they end in the, uh, when they cross to the US. So, I mean, I think the trauma, if for us, for me, it's, it's harsh and it's horrible from family members, friends and doing this kind of work. I just can't imagine from going through all of this, you know, like, it changes probably even your DNA or when you when you're doing this kind of journeys and, and there's very little um, there's very very little support for that you know like once they come here they are faced with this racism so it's 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 just I although I understand the question and I just want to say you know drink and bike and hang out with my kid and friends and uh, it is one thing I do and there is this other layer of, of, of the migrants that don't have documents I don't have the privilege that I do that are I are stuck with it, you know, and and I try to show that on the film a, a little bit, but that's a reality that's bigger than the film, and 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 so as far as I just want to say that that's just I don't know, I leave it at that. Thank you, Raul. Um, I just want to mention we didn't make a formal announcement because it just started, but um, if you have questions, do type them into the Q and A um, screen, and we'll try to get to as many of them. In fact, maybe all of them uh, before we finish. Um, the next question uh, that I'm picking up is from Rimbo Gunawan, and uh, maybe it can be for both Jason and Isabella. Um, it's a more of a conceptual one. Uh, Rimbo asks, liminality, I think, is an enduring feature of humanity and a subject that anthropologists will always deal with materially and ideologically. Does it mean in this sense there is a kind of universal time and transition or trajectory in human culture? Um, you know, I think for me, I've explored that concept a bit, um, and people have done that before me. Actually, Leo Chavez, um, in his book on, um, on undocumented migrants um, in the kind of mid-80s, sort of, maybe he's the first person working on, on Latin American migration to kind of use that, that concept. I sort of don't think about liminality so much anymore, um, or at least not in the, maybe not in this in the in the sense that he would have in that I, I, I sort of see people who become part of this process even when it's over and Isabel kind of said this already once it's over it, it it never leaves you right and I think in the case of 
like a lot of undocumented migrants in the U.S., um, your liminal status doesn't end when you get across a border. I mean, it you, it exi- it's it's part of your like personhood now um, as you sort of struggle to survive kind of in, in the shadows. And so I don't necessarily use it all that much because I find that it's become a more permanent sort of thing. And it's just other, for me, it's just, it's just other kind of, it's a different kind of category that, um, that maybe I want to, um, I want to develop that maybe that perhaps implies more, more permanence to this stuff. Um, but, you know, but there are definitely moments where, um, you could think about liminality as, as something experienced by migrants where it, it can get super amplified, um, you know, so it's, it's not even it's not even from, I think, uniform across like a, a border crossing experience. I mean, you're depending on where you are in Mexico, depending on where you are in Central America, you know, you are in kind of different stages of liminal. And you and you can think about like Gustavo as a good case of visa, no visa. Um, right. There's, he's, he's sort of moving out of these these different categories and um, he gets the visa and seeming that that's and that's why I think one of the things I really like about about his story is that the visa was supposed to solve everything. And yet it doesn't solve it doesn't solve anything um and uh like i've got uh, you know i mentioned my my student amelia frank vitale but before you know she's writing this dissertation where it's really about um this uh you know people talk about the, like deportees as needing to be reincorporated so honduras has this big project right now on reincorporating people who have been deported um and her argument is that they were never incorporated Right. They were marginal. They were living in this kind of liminal status as like youth in Honduras. And so when they get deported because they, they have to flee this, this space where they're not welcome, there's nothing f- to bring them back into this space. And so they exist in this other kind of category permanently. Um, and I, I really like thinking about it in, in that sense more because um, it's 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 messier and it doesn't it, it, it implies that, um, you know, you're never going to fix these issues unless you deal with these i think these much bigger they're not even immigration issues they're much bigger bigger kind of structural issues isabella yeah i mean i'll just build on that briefly i i agree with everything jason said i i think maybe the more interesting question is is what does it mean when the liminal is extended you know and, and for people who are joining us maybe aren't as familiar with the concept, you know, we, we talk about liminalities generally as transitioning people from one socially defined and accepted category into another. Um, but you can think about moving, you know, from childhood into adulthood or moving from a single person into a married person or a student into a graduate, right? And these are two identities that society sort of knows how to, how to make sense of them. And that space that exists in between is undefined, which can make the individual vulnerable because you don't have the protections of whatever the larger state apparatus is, but it can also make the individual threatening to the established structure because it's only in that space in between that change can happen, that something new can emerge. Um, And so to me, the interesting question about applying that framework to migration is exactly that, is what, what happens when that is extended? What happens when someone exists sort of continually in this space that's both vulnerable but also threatening we can think of it in the negative, but but there's another spin to it, which is that is the space where there's potential for change, for new things to emerge. Um, it's that it's that burning of the old, that breaking with the past, that really opens up the possibility for something new. Thank you, Isabella. Uh, we have a question from Stephanie Rupp, which actually gets to one of the questions I had wanted to ask. So it's great. Uh, they have asked it. The question is um, something that both Jason and Isabella have written about. It's, I'm interested in knowing more about how the migrants in both films spoke about family, the families that they left behind, the families and relationships that they shape through the process of migration and the dream of creating new spaces for their, and then within brackets, new, original, emerging families where they end up. If the migrants ended up having to return home, do they end up rethinking their original families or having to renegotiate family relationships that they had left behind, but ended up returning to? And I'll add to that, that in Border South, there's a sequence where they talk about the family you don't have is replaced by the new family that you have. Uh, and of course the heterosexual family unit is replaced in that film by the sociality of men forming a new family. So Jason and Isabella to both of you and to Raul, if you want to add. Yeah, I mean, I can I can jump in here. The um, so the the film you know is following what I kind of loosely refer to as as three families, but these are actually three drastically different family structures. And one of them is um, they would call themselves the Brotherhood. It's a group of young 
men and boys who are united by a couple of common experiences, those being that each of them have lost one parent or in some cases, both parents to war. Um, they're all the eldest in the family, which means that the obligation for caring you know, for younger siblings has fallen to them. And they're all on this migratory route uh, together. And they banded together with you know, the hopes of supporting each other in their goals of, of reaching Europe. Um, every one of the individuals, um, not just in this film or in the book project, but who I know and have interacted with over the course of many years in this space, is there um, with some connection to a family or a community that they are supporting. Um, that that their, their migration is, is both supported by and motivated by the goal for returning support to this community. Um, so this is an expensive journey. Um, the journey, whether you're starting out in a country that's relatively close, like Mali or Sierra Leone, or a country like the DRC or Sudan, which is much further, um, the journey costs thousands of euros. So you're paying smuggling fees at, at, at every turn, and you're also being extorted for more and more money at every turn. And what this means is that there's usually a family unit or an entire community that's banded together to support this one individual on their journey. And so the individuals talk about this as an honor to have been chosen, um, but also a, a, an, an, a burden, it's heavy. It's a heavy burden you carry even as you move further and further away from the physical space, you remain very, very tightly bound to it. Um, the individuals who are selected to go are, are in almost all cases male um, because of the dangers of, of you know, the migratory route and sort of who you want to expose to those dangers. So we generally only see women sent, and one of the main characters in, in, in The Burning is a woman um, who's lost her husband. And, that, and that's very reflective of sort of the stories that I see in that space is that it's, it's generally only when the women have lost the men that, that they're selected to go. Um, but, but they're often young men and boys who have been exceptional. You know, if you're gonna use all of your community's resources to support one journey, you're gonna choose the person who you think is most likely to succeed. And so we have these bands of, of brothers who have all been chosen by their communities for their exceptionality and who think of themselves as, as, as carrying the weight of the community and, and who know that they have to support one another in the hopes that one will make it. So just, um, you know, to close as sort of an illustration for people to imagine in your minds, you have these border fences around the enclaves in Northern Morocco. And uh, you have on one side, a wall of Guardia Civil officers. So the migrants know that they can't all make it across. The only chance that they have of making it is to have a huge group of them travel at once in the hopes that a couple of them may be able to evade the officers on the other side. So they arrange themselves in rings of stormers. There's the first, the middle and the back. Um, and in the back, they place the youngest ones, they place the women if there are any women in the group. And the first you know, ring of stormers run at the fence in this really sacrificial mission to distract the batons and the rubber bullets of the Guardia Civil so that those behind them might make it. So they do think of themselves as a family unit and they also think of themselves as sacrificing one another you know, for those that are more vulnerable behind them, both in that literal space of the border and also back in the home countries that, that they left behind. Um, I find that those ties remain strong, even for those who eventually make it over, that those who have made it to, you know, we'll call them semi-permanent homes somewhere in the EU, remain tightly bound to those communities that first supported them. Thank you, Isabella. Jason, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, with Latin American migration, you have a lot of different forms of kinship that happen. Um, and, you know, you really, you can't really generalize about like all Latinx folks. I mean, I think the, the Mexican migration experience is fundamentally different from the Central American experience. And you've got um, things like geography, um, nationality, um, impacting whether or not families are traveling together, whether or not people are traveling alone, uh, and how those things kind of configure and reconfigure um, at different points in the journey. Uh, you know, I think with 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 Mexican migrants that I've worked with, people will talk about like amigos del camino, people you someone you meet in a migrant shelter in northern Mexico and you try to cross the desert together, and that experience kind of bonds you. And I've written about um, some men who who become very close after after these experiences and then go on to become this kind of new family unit after the fact. Um, working with Central Americans, which is what I've been doing since about 2015, um, 
that's a much more complicated kind of uh, relationship. You've got a lot of people who are fleeing with family groups from, you know, so everyone from the household is leaving because because things are so dangerous in, um, in, um, in Honduras. You've got people who cannot go back to their families in Honduras because they literally will, will be killed and, or have their families killed as well. Um, and so there's folks who get kind of stuck in Mexico um, and then have to generate new, new, new types of, of families just to even sort of stay in motion. Uh, and, then, and then things get complicated for like Hondurans, which is largely who I work with, by issues of, um, of race and ethnicity. And so I currently work with groups of um, Afro Hondurans, Garifuna, um, who, I, and it's all smugglers. So I work with um, smuggler. Smuggling tends to be split along racial lines. So Garifuna smugglers only smuggle other Garifuna, and they tend to. It's a small. They're relatively small communities in, in Honduras and Belize, and so there's a lot of. Um, trust i think within those groups like if you connect with a garifuna smuggler there's a, probably just a few degrees of separation from that person and so you're less likely to be robbed and abused by that person whereas if you are a white like mestizo smuggler you will form a relationship with us with 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 a white um uh, uh, with white mestizo clients and then there's a lot more potential for um for being ripped off or being extorted uh, but I've been looking at how the moment of, you know, of movement, and it's mostly men that I, that I work with, you know, these men come together and they have these intense sort of relationships that then create this, these sort of bonds of family that maybe only last a week or two or three months and then, and then they break off and then suddenly someone gets ripped off, someone runs off, someone disappears. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, there's a, the dynamics within that are really, really complicated. And um, I think with, with the Honduran folks, so many of them, are leaving because, because both because their life is at risk and because to go back to those families puts those families at risk. And so you have them, um, this kind of the organized crime in, uh, in, in Honduras has really disrupted the family structure in, in ways that we weren't really seeing happening in, um, in, in places like, like Mexico. So it's a, it's a much more complicated kind of thing where I think with the Mexican uh, uh, sort of example, you have people who get deported after many years of being in the United States and they go back to the kind of home community and um, things are, are, are difficult and tough for them, partly because they've gone to the U.S. and so they come back and they've been changed and it's an unfamiliar kind of, kind of place, but they're not necessarily going to be in sort of direct danger like you would um, with, with Honduran folks. And so a lot of the Hondurans I know, as soon as they're deported, they land at that airport in San Pedro Sula and they're already looking for, for a way to get out of the country as soon as possible. So they don't even go back to the home community and kind of regroup. They're just immediately leaving. Whereas with Mexicans, depending on the, on, on, on the geography, pe people may likely spend uh, six months, a year, three years back with, with the distant family who then they reconnect with and then, and then we'll try again. Thank you, Jason. Uh, we have a few more questions uh, left, but we're also running out of time. So maybe what I can do with your permission, because I want to have time for each of you to tell us about uh, your next project. Um, and so maybe what I'll do is I'll acknowledge the questions and hopefully we can find a way to communicate with those people afterwards. We have a question on YouTube from Jacqueline Lyon, who asked about difference between book and film for uh, Jason. Uh, we have a question from Valerie Palacios, which is also about asking Jason what inspired you to do this project. Uh, both Scarlene Martinez and Teresa Benny asked about the role that gender plays for Teresa asked in the experience of migrants and Scarlene asked in the experience of yourselves while working on the project. Uh, Mariana Cadenas asked a question that we've sort of touched on, which is the difference between activist filmmaker and objective filmmaker, whether there is such a thing. And she asked about um, the goals of Border South. And uh, let's see, Alexander Farias asked a question, Riley Stoles, uh, and finally, Jonathan Reichardt asks about what is the reward or goal of making a film like this? Um, all very good questions, perhaps. Uh, there's a way to touch on them while we hear about uh, your next projects. I'd really like to hear from Jason, Isabella, and Raul what you're working on next. And maybe that can be a way to answer some of these questions indirectly, the difference between film and book, activist versus objective, you know, the question about that Jonathan Reichert asked about what is the reward of goal of making a film like this. Maybe we can start with Raul, what is your next project? And perhaps how it fits with this one also. Uh, yeah, so well, COVID destroyed a lot of my projects. Um, uh, one project uh, I was working on, I mean, I was actually, uh, at some point I was working, what about uh, Black Africans coming through the Americas, through Mexico, 
Um, I even got a fellowship in France to go do it. Um, that was too big of a project right now. Uh, the projects that are more likely to happen, one is another uh, sort of a visual ethnography about Mexican and, and Guatemalan grooms behind the Kentucky Derby. Um, and the other one, the, which it's sort of a very different than what I usually do, because although it's not going to have music score, it's probably going to have a lot of a, well, a lot of music. It's one is about the science of voice, and another one is about a Latinx uh, Mexican EMT, Mexican American EMT who um, uh, has depression problems. And that I don't know. I don't know how it's gonna, with COVID. A lot of those are they're happening, but they're happening in, in different uh, aspects. Uh, just quickly, uh, Border South. I mean, we had a big uh, impact campaign that got stopped because of COVID. We're going to go to Central America, and then um, and 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 then to the true Mexico and the the U.S. South, which is a place that has a lot of Mexican and Central American uh, immigrants. But that is going to happen if it happens. Going to be next year, um, and uh, with H, with four hostel terrain right now, and a lot of other uh, places that we're doing a lot of screenings like this uh, for Border South. And and just quickly on the activism. I mean, I just want to say that uh, I am an activist before being anything else, before being when I was working in construction, when I was working in, in community organized, I'm always an activist first. Uh, so I, it's, not, uh, it's not really that hard for me to, to dive into, into pushing films in, in certain ways and whatever I do. And I don't believe, it, as Isabella mentioned, I don't believe in objectivity. I don't think uh, there's such thing. So I guess I answer that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe also answered Mariana's question about the impact goals of Border South. So thank you for that. Yeah, that too. Yeah. Uh, Jason? Um, so I'm currently on leave, theoretically writing a book, um, although uh, I don't know about people out there it's incredibly difficult to be focused and productive right now so i'm mostly just trying to stay healthy and survive and uh and get my five miles of running in um and then maybe i can get a little bit of work done while homeschooling and doing everything else that uh, that comes with that um but theoretically i am working on this book about smugglers it's, the book is called soldiers and kings um and according to the press it'll hopefully be here by the end of 2022 um but in the meantime, as I'm working on that book, we also launched a global exhibition called Hostile Terrain 94, which was supposed to be wrapping up um, this week in New York and in DC next week. Uh, it's 130 plus participatory exhibitions that revolve around migrant death and getting people around the globe to fill out uh, toe tags and construct wall maps of, uh, of migrant death in the Arizona desert and then also engage with it in different ways. There's, a, there's an augmented reality component where people can hear stories of, of migration and they can explore the desert. Um, and then our hosts are generating um, a lot of additional content and collaborations with migrants and refugees in these different communities, um, you know, all across Europe and Latin America and elsewhere. We've had to go virtual um, for most places, although there are a few physical shows that are currently up. Um, I think there's, a, there's one at Penn State that's physically up. There's one, there's a couple in Texas that are physically up, um, Amsterdam and Frankfurt, Oder. Uh, in Germany. So there's maybe about a dozen, 10 physical shows that are up. The rest of those shows will um, will open hopefully by the end of 2021. And so we're just kind of in a holding pattern. And in the meantime, we are just hosting a whole series of virtual events. So if people are interested in getting involved, they can go to our website, undocumentedmigrationproject.org or hostileterrain94.org and learn about various initiatives, uh, including one that we're doing right now that's called a, a moment of global remembrance, which we are seeking 3,200 volunteers to record themselves, either making audio or video recordings, reading out the names of, of those who have died in the Arizona desert, which will then be compiled into uh, a large file that will be used in online and in-person exhibitions next next year. So we're, we're keeping busy virtually and I'm um, just also mentally preparing myself for various possibilities that could happen um, the first week of, no of November. Mm -hmm. Yes, we all are. Isabella? Yeah, um, well, I'll start by saying it is just such an honor to have been a part of this, especially with Jason and Raul, who are two activists that I greatly admire and whose work has been you know, influential to my own and to the way that I think about anthropology and what its possibilities are. 
I hope that everyone who has stuck with us for these two hours will, will go check out Hostile Terrain. It's an incredibly important project that's happening right now. Um, I have just finished the edit on the burning, which in some ways feels like the beginning of the project, you know, so I'm, I'm thinking about ways in which, um, given this new landscape of um, viewing movies, we can get it out there and in front of as many audiences as, as possible. So that's still taking up a, a lot of my time and energy in exciting ways. Um, I also am starting work on uh, the project I briefly mentioned earlier, which is uh, working with a smuggling ring um, in North Africa to explore sort of who these characters are and, and how they come to be and um, what their role is in, in the community. Um, I have the great honor of currently translating to um, English a wonderful book that one of the subjects of the burning, uh, Mamadou Salou Diallo wrote about, about his journey from Guinea to France. So I'm very excited to be able to share his story in, in his own words um, with, with audiences soon. Thank you, Isabella. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe all three of you are also raising children, which is the future. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, we're turning to Uzma now for closing remarks. I just want to just quote two dialogues from the two films that really gave me a lot of hope. Um, one is from Border South, just the line where they explain why they don't give up. The character says, as usual, immigrants are stubborn. And then in the burning, there's this line that says, um, I, I believe it's Kia, migrants are kings of the world. Migrants never give up. Yeah. And with that optimistic view, uh, I turn to Uzma. That's that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Naeem, Jason, Isabella, Raul, for that really thought-provoking and remarkable panel. Like I'm still kind of processing, and especially after this conversation, I feel like I want to or perhaps actually need to rewatch Border South. So for those of you who are interested in doing the same, um, as, as Jason was mentioning, this week was supposed to be Hostile Train 94 in New York City. So this was going to be one of the attendant program. This is some of the attendant programming. So thanks to Hostile Train and, and to Jason Rell, we'll maintain access to the film. So if you'd like to watch Border South, you have this week to, to watch it, to rewatch it, to kind of think through some of the conversations that we've had here. Um, as for the film, The Burning, um, it will be released next year, um, but you can certainly pick up a copy of Isabella Alexander Nathani's book, Burning at Europe's Border, an ethnography on the African migrant experience in Morocco. So there's so much, as I said, like I'm just processing, um, and this is really a, a mark of a really robust panel, so I really appreciate it. Um, I, it's such a, such a rare treat to be able to listen to activists who are anthropologists who are thinking, who are on the ground, and who are also filmmakers and writers. Like There's just so many different levels to this conversation. So thank you, Jason. Thank you, Raul, Isabella, and Naeem. And to our audience, thank you for joining us for this panel, Migration Through the Camera's Lens. Our next event is on November 9th, and it's entitled, What is the Utility of Anthropology in This Moment of Emergency? For this event, we'll be joined by professors Deborah Thomas and Bianca Williams. I hope you'll be able to join us for that important conversation. Once again, thanks to the panelists and the moderator and to all you who have attended this from all across the globe. Be well and be safe. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.